So, you know all those stories about how it's impossible to tell twins apart. I say this is complete nonsense. Oh, they may be great stories, but I knew twins. In second grade, I met my first couple, two kids my age. I could tell them apart instantly, Peter and Paul, and Paul became a good friend for many years at school, although I never really liked Peter. A year later, our class had its first twin girls, and although it was a little confusing for a week or so, especially when they were wearing the same clothes, after a couple of weeks most of the kids could easily tell the difference between Katie and Karen. Three years later, triplets appeared at school Susan, Sheila, and Sandra. Sheila was in several of my classes, and I could always tell her apart from Susan and Sandra. I'll admit, since I only shared one class with Sandra until the end of high school, and never with Susan, it was harder to differentiate between the two, and I continued to make mistakes until the year before we graduated. Sharon and Shirley burst onto the scene in my ninth grade year. Two beautiful brunettes who made my heart race as students from other high schools began to join our group, with Charity and Chastity joining in our third year, even though they were sophomores who transferred from another state. Yes, I went to a very large high school. There were almost 900 people in our graduating class. And yes, among those nearly 900, we had two sets of twin girls, one set of twin boys, one set of girl triplets, and a pair of twin girls I knew a year younger than me. There were also several pairs of twins, and two more pairs, according to my old school yearbook, from junior classes that I did not meet, or at least I do not remember, but that is already more than 3,500 students. Perhaps there really was something in the water during those years when so many twins were born. And yes, it was a very large high school class. We were squeezed in like sardines in a can. And in the years that followed, the school district divided the students between three different schools, including my alma mater. The year before I graduated, our school was the largest in the state. And the year I graduated, it was only slightly inferior to another school that was literally next door and it too was divided into three a few years later as the furious wave of new school construction. I'm telling you all this for one thing. Identical twins are not exactly identical. If you know them well enough, you won't need the deepest knowledge to eventually begin to differentiate between them. A speck here, lighter skin there, this one is a little heavier by a few pounds, this one has hair parted closer to the center of his head, this one has a slight limp in his gait compared to his brother because someone ran into him and broke his ankle in fifth grade at Children's Baseball League. These are small things, and those who don't spend enough time with the twins can get confused. But anyone who knew them could easily tell them apart, even from a distance. For example, Peter, Paul, and I all went to the same college after high school. I could tell which one of them was sitting on the other side of campus, even when they were sitting dressed the same. Never confused. And then, of course, as I hinted, there was Sharon and Shirley. They were both five feet three inches tall, with shoulder-length dark brown hair, the bluest eyes I had ever seen, a fairly good figure, with noticeable but not overly large breasts, thin waists, and legs that reached the ground. As they liked to say, overall, they were to my taste, but perhaps not for everyone, both had a slightly nasal voice, and both laughed a little too loudly at the inappropriate jokes, and too quietly at the ones that were actually funny, if you know what I mean. Neither of them dressed to impress, but they both dressed smartly. Both may have seemed too smart, let's face it. The triplets were in the top ten of our class, blonde and incredibly smart, but Sharon and Shirley were in the top third, so I'm not kidding when I say that the girls from whom my heart sank they could be cute enough for most guys. There were quite a few really beautiful girls in our class. I met and first got to know Sharon at the end of our freshman year of high school until our sophomore year. Sharon and I took classes together, and we were always put in the same group to do group projects. We got along well, and I overcame my teenage insecurities and asked her out towards the end of my sophomore year. During this time, I didn't have any activities in common with Shirley, but we occasionally talked when I was around Sharon, even going on a double date once. Of the two sisters, I seemed to be a little more compatible with Shirley than with Sharon. When we talked about music, Shirley knew the Beatles better, and Sharon liked pop music more. I'm a fan of the Beatles. 
Sharon didn't understand when I said that some animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Shirley laughed and recognized the quote from Animal Farm and even called the woman who instigated it a fancy pig, thereby making an additional pun. All the while, Shirley and I were happily exchanging remarks, and Sharon at first seemed bored and then began to get annoyed with the conversation. One of the things that surprised me was that some twins and triplets tried to look as similar as possible. They wore and exchanged the same clothes. Some twins always kept their hair the same length and style and so on. They did everything they could to make sure everyone knew they were twins. Sharon and Shirley, as well as several others, did the opposite. Sharon wore her hair in a short bob, while Shirley wore her hair longer to shoulder length. Sharon loved to wear dangling earrings. Shirley preferred carnations. Shirley had a white streak on her right side, reminiscent of a young Elvira. Sharon loved to add a little colored streak to the left. In other words, everyone could easily distinguish them. I never mentioned other, more subtle signs. The question simply never came up. Over the years, girls simply assumed that I could easily tell them apart precisely because they tried to look different. Like I said, Shirley and I had more in common than her sister, even though I was dating Sharon. That doesn't mean Sharon and I didn't have an attraction. Remember that heart flutter, burning heart. Something about her really turned me on and attracted me. The question was, when we were together, was it just a physical attraction or something more? A year later, in the summer before our senior year, one of my buddies, Tommy Edgars, took me aside and asked me if I was serious about Sharon. As it turned out, he and she also had common activities, and although she was not dating him, she flirted with him, and he was interested. And at that moment I realized that I didn't really care. Oh sure, she was my girl, but I realized that I was more attracted to her sister than to herself in the end. And it wasn't that she was flirting. I myself have flirted with other girls in her presence, and she has flirted with guys, but we never crossed the line. I knew, and Tommy confirmed, that it was just flirting. Hell, I've seen her flirt with Tommy a few times at some of the parties we've been to. So I sat down with Sharon in her living room. I'm sure she expected something completely different. Sharon, I really like you. You are very dear to me. But I'm not in love with you. I enjoy our time together and appreciate you. But I don't want to stop you from finding a guy who really loves you. I don't want to be a stone around your neck. I included the stone line because we studied the rhyme of the ancient mariner in English class last year, and it led to us passionately kissing, usually interrupted by Shirley before I could go any further. I know for a fact, and I suspected at the time that I heard giggling from the hallway, around the corner from the living room, as Sharon responded, Huh? I don't understand. What stone? This was not what I expected. I expected arguments, screams, tears, slaps, her blows to the chest. But instead I received, what stone? Tommy Edgars asked me if he could take you out on a date. He knows we've been dating for a long time, and he's a good guy. He wants to invite you. I told him. I told him I didn't mind. Please don't be mad at him if you're mad at me, I asked. So, Davy, are you leaving me? Sharon asked finally starting to understand. Yes, and no, we can still go on a date. I'm just giving you the opportunity to say yes when he asks you out. And maybe I'll invite someone else too, I suggested weakly. Whom, who is this girl trying to get in? Sharon demanded. Well, no one yet. Everyone respects you, and they wouldn't do it without your consent. Like Tommy talked to me first. But, there's someone I kind of would like to invite. What's her name? Sharon demanded. Who is this girl that you like more than me? Well, I was thinking about inviting Shirley. She's a great girl, and I mean, your sisters. But I don't want to stop Tommy from asking you out, and Shirley and I get along well. I definitely heard a small sigh. As I said, now I know for sure that someone was listening from the hallway, but then I didn't know it yet. Shirley admitted this to me on our honeymoon three years later. Listen, we can go on a double date. You and Tommy, me and Shirley, if you say a good word to her for me. If anything goes wrong, you just say the word rock, 
and I'll take you and Shirley away from Tommy and take you home. Agreed, I suggested. Tommy Edgars, ha, huh? he's so cute. Okay, but if he turns out to be an unsuccessful gentleman, you will pay me for it, and I will take you away from Shirley, Sharon agreed. While I was dating Sharon, Shirley had several boyfriends. Some of them were nice guys, even a couple of my friends, but mostly she dated low caste guys, substance addicts, losers in other words, what we called losers in high school. The school was big. The competition for the best girls and guys could be serious. I wasn't the richest, the smartest, the handsomest, or the most athletic guy. But I was above average in at least two of the four areas, just above average in one, and on par with most people in the last. At the same time, many girls clearly wanted me to invite them. All this meant that even girls above average could be pushed out of the list of the best. It's ironic because it's similar to a phenomenon I've heard about. In small schools, it can sometimes be difficult to find a match, with too few good options and too much competition. And Shirley ended up essentially in the middle-class category, although it was not her fault. I called their house again that evening, giving Sharon time to get ready and telling Tommy that she was expecting his call. Their mother, Ellen, was surprised when I asked to use Shirley instead of Sharon. But Shirley must have been sitting near the phone because less than 10 seconds after she was called, she was already on the line. In short, the word stone was never mentioned on the double date. Tommy was crazy about Sharon, and she enjoyed the attention. Meanwhile, Shirley grinned all the time when we were together. You know, I was the one who suggested to Tommy that Sharon was interested in him. Shirley admitted to me quietly late that evening when they went dancing. What? She didn't show any interest until I told her that I could be her lifeline if the date went badly, I wondered. Well, I needed to get the process started. I knew she liked him. Well, he's fine, but... Shirley drawled. Oh, you are a cunning girl. Was this your plan to try and fight off your sister's boyfriend? I asked with a smile. Her Alfred E. Newman's face, with its, who, me. The expression was confirmation enough for me. Three years later, we had a double wedding. Tommy started working for his dad's company, who owned a Toyota dealership in town, and I found a good job in it working on computers after getting my associate's degree and several certifications. There were no best men or bridesmaids at the wedding as each sister was each other's maid of honor and Tommy and I were each other's best men. We left the church as David and Shirley Miller and Thomas and Sharon Edgars, although we went to more than one place on our honeymoon. Shirley and I went to Aruba, and Tommy and Sharon went to Cancun. Overall, it was a wonderful experience getting to know each other through the joys of love, feeling her sweet smell, enjoying the taste of her breasts, enjoying her body. We were both virgins on our wedding day, but during those two weeks in the hot sun, there were no inhibitions for us. The first few times, Shirley was bad at giving pleasure. By the end of the second week, after diligent practice, they became incredible. Likewise, it took me several tries before I found the desired spot, and she even stopped me once, telling me I was doing everything wrong in those early days. By the end of the second week, she was screaming my name, and we barely left the room to see the sights and just relax. I heard us called newlyweds several times with nods of approval from complete strangers. Yes, it was incredible. All good things must come to an end, and all too soon our time in Aruba came to an end, and we returned home. I made Shirley wait in the car while I carried my suitcases in, and then I returned, picked her up from the car, and carried her in my arms across the threshold of our apartment, where we began our new life. From the very first weeks at home, life settled into a certain routine. There was sex almost every night and almost every morning, as is the case with newlyweds. Fridays were our date night. I'd take Shirley out to dinner, and then we'd find something inexpensive to do for fun. We usually finished by 11 p.m. and made love until 2 or 3 in the morning, after which we slept until 10 in the morning on Saturday. On Saturdays we also had a date night, but with Tommy and Sharon. Tommy made a little more money. They immediately moved into a house bought and paid for by his father, so they had no rent or mortgage even if their salary was not much more than ours, so Tommy often partially subsidized the double dates. 
He paid for dinner three out of four times, and I paid for the fourth time. He admitted to me that he felt like he owed me for allowing him to be with Sharon, and besides, we were now brothers. Every day after we returned from our honeymoon, and I mean absolutely every day, Shirley and Sharon spoke on the phone. It didn't matter if it was a date night, it didn't matter if we were going to see them in a few hours, or even if we had already seen them that day. They were on the phone every day. Shirley talked in front of me most of the time, so I quickly realized that they even shared quite intimate details of their lives, including our sex life. This almost caused our first serious fight, until I realized that Shirley was only complimenting my skills, size, and abilities. I didn't consider myself particularly big, and all I knew about my skills was that Shirley seemed pleased and I liked what was happening. It's been maybe seven months since we returned from our honeymoon. I was in the kitchen when I heard the beginning of the conversation, and my mood instantly soured. Oh yeah, Davy, and I do it three times a night, most days. And it's just great when... Yes, three times a night. No, not in the morning. We don't have time in the morning for more than a quick time. Most nights. And you and Tommy. Right? You see? One time, and that's it? What about? Unusual sex? Well, Davy likes... Ugh. Yeah, he takes a bath if we do it before anything else. He says he wants to kiss me when we make love. Yeah. Well, yeah, I tried that once. I didn't like it, and Davy didn't think it was anything special, though, every time. Like I say, Davy doesn't think it's a big deal, but he'll do it for me before. Well, he's grooming me for it. It's not that I'm not always ready from the front. Yes, three times a night, usually. I guess we start with him pleasuring me, and then me pleasuring him. He didn't succeed at first, but oh my, yes. What size is it? Damn, girl, how do you even let this in? He seems to have a lot more than Davy, and he gets tired easily. Oh yes, it can take a long time. You need to stop this. So, according to my sisters, I was tougher. But Tommy was bigger than me. Like I said, I didn't like her sharing such intimate details, even if it was her sister. But for the sake of harmony in the marriage, I decided to swallow my resentment and did not raise this topic. Over the years of her relationship with Tommy, Sharon has noticeably reduced her flirting with other guys. It wasn't that she stopped doing it completely, but Tommy was a little jealous and she was fascinated by him. As for me, it seemed like I was out of the game for her since I was now her sister's husband, even if I had once been her boyfriend. So it took me a while to notice that Sharon was starting to flirt with me a little at our Saturday meetings. It wasn't too obvious or overt, but it was there. After a month or so of these subtle hints, I finally took the plunge and spoke to Shirley one night after we had finished a spirited lovemaking session following our double date. Shirley, I don't know how to say this and I don't want to cause trouble. I swear I'm not encouraging her, but... Davy, honey, don't you think I know what you're trying to say? This is my sister. I see it. It's just her nature, and as long as you don't take it too far, I don't care. I know, no matter how it ends, I still won. She smiled at me. No, I won it. I got you. And Tommy won because he got it. So we are all winners. I smiled back with relief. Oh, you are such a smooth talking devil. Shirley hugged me. That night she took more out of me than usual, and I was almost unable to express myself the next morning. Almost. This is how life went on. I was married to the better twin, at least for me and my ex was married to a friend who seemed to have the horse size, but could only do it once a night. Both girls got what they wanted, I guess, although I sometimes heard Shirley tell Sharon details that made her jealous. I don't know what Sharon told Shirley. Sometimes, after long phone conversations with her sister, Shirley would be more passionate than usual, but I tried not to get too deep into these matters. We had been married for three years when the first, in retrospect, incident happened. We were discussing my upcoming 25th birthday and asked if I had any special plans. I want to celebrate this in a small circle, just us or maybe me and Tommy and Sharon. Maybe we'll go somewhere nice to have dinner and dance. What do you think? I answered, this is a great idea. The three of us will take you to Ruth's Chris and then we'll go dancing at the Sunlight Lounge. We'll get dressed and it'll be a little mini ball. 
Shirley said enthusiastically. Hey, wait, I didn't get what I wanted at graduation. You were still holding on then. It would be nice to get something hot for dessert from your girlfriend, I joked. It might not be 100% repeatable, okay? Shirley replied with a smile, gently touching my growing arousal. After a short pause, discussing other, more intimate topics, we continued the conversation while lying in bed. So, do you want a formal outfit? Or just so that I'm in a good suit? I asked, barely thinking from fatigue. It's your birthday, honey. What do you want? She sighed. Well, we'd be arrested if you wore what I wanted you to wear. Or you would freeze. Oh, you mean what I'm wearing now? She teased. Maybe with stockings and heels? I suggested jokingly. Looks like I'm going to have to wear something over these underwear, or you're going to have to fight everyone off me, she laughed. I'm not going to fight anyone off, and hopefully I'll be the only one to jump over you. I winked, taking advantage of her pun. I'll find something, don't worry, she answered. A few days later, when I returned home from work, I immediately noticed that both Shirley and Sharon were sitting in the living room, which was to the right of the front door. Shirley immediately stood up and came towards me to kiss me, as always. But it wasn't her who surprised me, it was Sharon. I looked at her and noticed that she had washed out a touch of color from her hair and changed the style to a shorter version of Shirley's cut, minus her signature white streak. In amazement, I turned to my wife and noticed that she, too, had washed away her white locks. Both girls now had natural hair color. Hey, what happened to my sexy goth girlfriend and her twin assistant? I joked. We just wanted a little change to try something new. How do you like it? Shirley replied as Sharon nodded in the background. Then I noticed that Shirley's hair length had also changed. Both sisters now wore the same short, ear-length fairy haircut. Besides, the white strand was starting to make me look older. And I want to look my age, my wife continued. Great, now no one will be able to distinguish you. I praised them, because it was my duty as a husband. Although in fact I loved the image of her that I met several years ago, a confirmation of the old truth. A man gets married, hoping that his wife will never change, and a woman gets married, hoping that her husband will definitely change. My joke prompted a quick exchange of glances between the twins, which meant nothing but still made me feel slightly uneasy. We wanted to show you our new dresses for your birthday party next week, Shirley said enthusiastically. Oh, I see. What should I do? I asked. Sit and wait, Sharon said, standing up and leaving with her sister. It is said that a man spends 10% of his married life waiting for his wife to change clothes. That's exactly what I felt. At least 30 minutes passed before the girls returned. Ta-da! How do you like it? Sharon exclaimed, throwing her arms up in the classic showgirl pose, bending her wrists and sticking her left leg forward. She turned her body a quarter to the right, leaving her face turned towards me. Shirley, without thinking twice, took exactly the same position next to her sister. To begin with, the cut of the dresses was the same. They were mid-length, with a slit that reached to the top of their pearl-colored French stockings, which revealed the lace top of the stockings, where the leg began. There was a wide ribbon of the same color at the waist, with a large bow on the right hip. The top was a classic 50s style, with ties at the shoulders and a neckline that reached almost to her navel, revealing the smooth skin between her breasts. The back was open, ending in a neat semicircular line just above the waist. Both were wearing high heels. Shirley's were scarlet, Sharon's were azure. Shirley wore the diamond earrings I gave her last Christmas, and Sharon had silver leaf earrings dangling in her ears. With the exception of the color of the dresses, shoes, and type of earrings, they were as similar as possible. From their point of view, they knew that I could tell them apart by their wedding and engagement rings, as well as earrings, Tommy's father was significantly richer than mine, so Tommy was able to buy a ring with a two-and-a-half carat princess cut and smaller diamonds around. My more modest fortune allowed me to purchase a one-carat cushion cut, but both girls seemed quite pleased with their rings. Realizing that they were dressed exactly the same, I decided to make fun of them. Oh, wow, 
I wonder which one of you I'm going to pick up and carry upstairs to possess. I didn't mean anything serious. It was just one of those jokes you tell when you're flirting and feeling fun and playful. Oh, me, Sharon responded immediately. No, no, my husband will take me upstairs, woman, Shirley immediately retorted, with obvious relief on her face at my joke. Yeah, I exclaimed, standing up and walking towards Shirley to pick her up. As I started to walk up the stairs, I looked over my shoulder and said to Sharon, Tell Tommy he's lucky too. The remaining week before my birthday went as usual. Morning and evening lovemaking, work, missing my wife, then home, dinner, and more sex. A few hours of sleep supplemented this rhythm, but overall, life was wonderful. On the Friday night after our date, Shirley practically killed me, trying to exhaust all my strength. At some point, I even said, I give up, but like a demon, she ignored my request and continued her way. And again, I think at some point I just lost consciousness and fell asleep somewhere around half past four in the morning. I was woken up the next morning around noon in the most fantastic way a man can imagine, having a beautiful and sexy woman pleasure you. Seeing that I was starting to wake up, Shirley pulled away from me, then moved up my body and smiled. Good morning, birthday boy. I have something special for you today, she whispered with a smile and slowly started having sex with me. I swear she purred, bringing me pleasure. It was already one o'clock in the afternoon when I finally got out of bed to go to the bathroom. When I returned, Shirley was getting dressed in a hurry. Hey, what happened? Why are you getting dressed? We don't have to see Tommy and Sharon for a few more hours. I thought you would give me my gift right now. I smiled. You will receive your gift later, I promise. But Sharon and I have something to do for a couple of hours, Shirley said as she put on her shoes and walked out the door. The door slammed and I was left alone on my birthday, which came as a surprise to me. I ended up just turning on the TV and playing PlayStation for a couple of hours a rare pleasure, although it wasn't exactly what I wanted that day. During this time, I received a couple of congratulatory calls from my parents and from Shirley's parents, even one from my boss. Still, despite having a good time playing the game, I was a little sad that the most important person in my life was gone for the day on my birthday. Shirley stormed into the house around 5 p.m., which proved a bit problematic. Our table at Ruth's Chris was booked for 7.10 p.m., and I still hadn't had time to shower and get dressed, and neither had she. Usually our process of getting ready to go out included a bit of teasing, where I would chase her around the room, and it often dragged on. But to my surprise, Shirley was already dressed, with a new hairstyle, fresh makeup, and perfectly done nails. I thought she was crazy because she wasn't going to freshen up before she left in the morning, which meant she was either going to smell like sex all evening, or she would have to mess up that makeup and hair if she just freshened up. In the bathroom. Noticing the look on my face when I saw her, Shirley sighed and began to explain. Sharon and I were at the spa. That's why I ran away so quickly I was already late. All I have to do is change my clothes. But you, Mr. Miller, need to wash, shave, well, in general, get yourself in order before your date with a hot girl. Yes, I don't need to impress anyone, because it's my birthday, it's my birthday, woohoo, I answered her, starting to dance merrily. Oh, so you're so sure? Are you sure I'm yours because it's your birthday today? Well, she began and then sang, you say it's your birthday, it's my birthday too, gonna have a good time. So happy birthday to you. Shirley knew about my love for the Beatles. I grabbed her and pulled her towards me, but she hesitated a little when I hugged her. And then she relaxed, took a deep breath, but again slightly pushed me away. Damn, I thought you already washed yourself after our morning fun. Have you forgotten about soap? She teased. Well, I was hoping someone would join me, but when that didn't happen, I decided I'd have a second chance right now. I explained, then glanced at her fresh makeup. Though it doesn't look like it'll happen until the end of the evening, huh? Go take a shower, and then maybe we can discuss this later, but no promises, she laughed. I ran to the bathroom and got to work, carefully shaving my face until it was perfectly smooth. 
I didn't want Shirley to have irritation from my stubble that would prevent her from sitting down the next day. I even wore cologne. When I got out of the shower, my suit was already on the bed, and Shirley was fully dressed except for her shoes. Realizing that we needed to meet Tommy and Sharon in front of the restaurant, I hurried to get dressed, but at the same time I continued to look at the vision in Scarlet. For some reason, she mostly had her back to me, which she rarely did when we were going somewhere together, although she asked me to help her with the chain. It was a small pendant necklace that I gave her for our first Christmas when we officially started dating. I already replaced it twice with more expensive ones, but it remained her favorite on our dates. I pulled her towards me and gently bit her ear as I fastened the chain, watching us in the mirror. You know, that ruby necklace I gave you would have suited you better. It would look great with this dress, I whispered to her, lightly nibbling her earlobe with a small diamond earring, looking at us in the mirror. I knew it was useless, because she always wore this pendant on our dates, she saved pearls for family dinners, and rubies only for funerals or weddings. And suddenly she surprised me. Oh, she began, and then reached up to her neck to remove the necklace, shocking me. Actually, with this dress, nothing around the neck would look better, she said, and, taking off the chain, put it on the table. Okay, let me text Sharon that we are almost ready to leave. I'll be back in a minute, she added and left. She returned a couple of minutes later, and we headed to the car. I opened the door, and when she sat down, almost her entire slender silhouette was shown to me. I knew she was wearing stockings without garters and black panties with silver thread. Like I said, she showed it all off, although perhaps not on purpose because the slit on the dress was so high. We flirted happily all the way to the parking lot where Tommy and Sharon were waiting for us. When I went to open the door for Shirley, she stopped me when I had already opened the door and said, Davy, I want to stop taking the pills in two months. This would be the perfect time, so. This could be your last birthday before you become a dad. Or this time next year, I'll be as big as a whale. I want this evening to be special for you. My jaw nearly dropped when she took my hand after dropping that bombshell on me. I understood why she wanted to wait a couple more months. She didn't want to endure the hardest part of her pregnancy during the hot summer months, and she didn't want me to overreact to the news. But she also chose this moment to tell me because she wanted us to celebrate with a big dinner and an evening of dancing. With a smile, she took my hand, slammed the car door, and led me to Tommy and Sharon. I could see from Sharon's face that she knew what Shirley had just told me, but Tommy seemed completely unaware, which threw me off balance. Tommy found out the news when we were already sitting at the table and placing our order. His reaction was joyful. Wow, this is great news. Sharon and I just decided to try for a baby too dot 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 it quote s the first month. He winked at me. We enjoy the process. Imagine how delighted their parents will be if they have two grandchildren one after the other. And if Sharon gets pregnant quickly, Shirley can use her maternity clothes since she'll be a couple of months behind, and they can change. Hey, dinner is on me. It's your birthday, brother. The T-bone steak I was served was excellent, as was the rest of the food. We lingered a little longer enjoying dessert to give the food time to settle. All this time, Shirley played legs under the table with me, sitting to my left. Sharon, meanwhile, was flirting as usual, touching my arm, leaning closer to show me her cleavage. Tommy, as usual, didn't notice anything strange while his wife and my wife took turns entertaining me. And then, one day, her foot slid under the table, kicked off her shoe, and began to gently stroke me between my legs through my trousers. This is what made me delay our departure for a few minutes. Time passed, and closer to 2045, I noticed that the waiter was ready to let us go in order to free up the table for the next guests. I finally got over my emotions, and we headed to the Sunlight Lounge, which was just a block away from the restaurant. I spent the rest of the evening on the dance floor, spending half the time there while Tommy danced with Sharon or Shirley for about one out of five songs. We drank, but not too much. A bottle of wine with dinner was enough to give us a slight buzz, and we just maintained this state everything was fun and relaxed, but not too much. Around 12.30 Shirley suddenly looked at her watch. 
Oh, damn, I wanted to give you a special gift at midnight, but for that we would have to be home already, she said disappointedly, then glanced at Sharon. Shall we go? Sharon nodded slightly and added, But I need to go to the ladies' room. Come with me. They both got up and went to the ladies' room. I never understood why women can't go to the toilet alone. They always have to go together. Have you figured it out, Dave? Tommy asked me, watching them leave. If I figure this out, I think I'll get a Nobel Prize and a statue in Washington. David Miller is the first person to understand women. We both laughed at that. It took a little longer than usual before they returned, and something was wrong. I was still a little tipsy to immediately understand what it was, but something was definitely wrong. The charming lady in red walked up to me, sat on my lap, and wrapped her arms around my shoulders before sticking her tongue in my mouth. Get a room, you two, her sister laughed, standing up and tugging on Tommy's hand. See you tomorrow, Davy, she said over her shoulder as she walked out with him, swaying her hips in her blue dress. See you tomorrow, Davy, she said over her shoulder as she walked out with Tommy, swaying her hips in her blue dress and reminding me that in a few hours we would be having lunch with their parents to celebrate my birthday. I was still trying to figure out what was wrong when the one sitting on my lap pulled me out. I want it so bad that I can't wait to get in bed with you so I can give you a real birthday present. She whispered in my ear, biting it gently, and led us to the parking lot, a little behind her sister. In the dim light of the streets after midnight, her face was not clearly visible as she led me the last few steps to the car. When she got into the car, I noticed purple panties flashing under her dress, and this reminded me of something that was already spinning in my head, but did not give me peace. I wasn't drunk, I'll tell you straight away. Yes, I was slightly drunk, but I was fully conscious. Legally, I probably shouldn't have been driving, but I was careful enough. And to be honest, I didn't hit a single car, didn't hit a single pedestrian, and didn't even break any parking rules. Okay, just kidding. We reached the house completely calmly, without a single scratch on the curb. But by the time I pulled into the parking lot, apart from one vague feeling that followed me all the way, I was practically sober. But this vague feeling still did not go away. Something was wrong, and I couldn't relax until I figured out what it was. I continued to steal glances at my sexy companion, realizing that it had something to do with her, but I couldn't figure out what exactly. Returning to the car, I looked at it again under the flickering light of the street lights. She seemed to smile differently than usual. Her hands seemed softer in mine, her voice was a little less hoarse. Her face looked a little... swollen? It was as if she was in that same monthly cycle when bloating begins. But I definitely remembered that it was about a week ago. When I opened the door and she entered the apartment, a light slap on her ass finally sobered me up. Under the bright light of the hallway, I had enough time to take it all in, and I realized that the woman who had thrown off her dress in my living room, exposing her breasts, was not my wife. As soon as I realized that Sharon was trying to seduce me, I was overcome with cold terror. If Sharon was here, then where was Shirley? At this point my brain started working like an old Rolodex. Click, 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 bingo. At the same moment, my body reacted in sync with my mind, and I rushed to the bathroom, trying to get ahead of everything I had eaten that evening, but failed and vomited right on the floor. It was like a scene from the old horror movie The Exorcist, except that my head didn't rotate 360 degrees, it went down to my chest, and the vomit wasn't pea-colored. Although I was kneeling in a puddle of vomit, with my head in the toilet, Sharon rushed towards me, not realizing that she had already been exposed. Davy, honey, what's wrong with you? What's happening? She asked, trying to comfort me the way Shirley would. I... I exhaled with another wave of vomit. I think it's obvious what's going on. I tried to swallow the vomit. Sharon, I finally said. What? What are you saying, honey? Sharon went home with Tommy. She tried to lie. Do you really think I'm so stupid that I can't tell my wife from her sister when I'm sober? I answered with irritation. Davy, you're scaring me. Real fear began to appear in her eyes as it began to dawn on her that they had made a mistake. 
Slowly but surely, the realization dawned on her that their plan had failed. Davy, you must be sick. Let me take you to bed. I'll take care of you. She tried to be caring, like Shirley would do, to get out of the situation. As she extended her hand towards me, I was overwhelmed with the realization that they were plotting against me. Don't touch me. I want you to leave my apartment and tell my soon-to-be ex-wife that she can go to hell. Oh, and I'll be sure to tell Tommy what you did. Sharon recoiled in horror. Davy, what are you talking about? It's me, she exclaimed in despair. Do you think I can't tell my wife from her sister? Who do you take me for? Hell, Tommy might be having the exact same conversation with your sister right now. You're not a photocopy, Sharon. And with these words, her last hope of deception faded away. I just wanted to know what I lost when I let my sister take you, Davy. She loves you so much and praises you in bed all the time. Tommy wants and that's it. He keeps me happy. But I wanted to know what it's like with someone who can do it more than once, Sharon begged. No, no, it won't work out that easy. I know you told Shirley about Tommy's size and my stamina. You discussed this behind my back. And now you decided to go even further, I shouted. I saw how she was going to lie to me again. No, Davy, she's just going to bed, no sex. The plan was that she would get a headache and... Stop lying, Sharon. The plan was for you to switch places today and then return to your roles tomorrow in front of everyone, right? I raised my voice. No, Davy, of course not. She lied again. And you're also bad at lying, by the way. Shirley is clearly better at this. I didn't fully understand what was going on until we got home. Hell, even your breasts are not the same as hers. Shirley has a mole right here, I said, pointing to a smooth spot on her left breast. Do you think a man who loves his wife won't recognize her breasts? Davy, please stop, Sharon begged. I'm terribly guilty. I just wanted to know what I lost. Please don't tell Tommy. Don't tell Tommy, not telling my best friend that he had sex with my wife and his wife tried to seduce me. Not just no, but damn no. I'm going to scream about it at every turn, especially when I file for divorce. Divorce? You don't understand what you're saying. Davy, calm down. You don't want to divorce, surely. The shock on her face showed that they didn't even think about the consequences if they were caught. What the hell? Of course I know what I'm saying. I'm divorcing her, and I certainly won't hide the reasons. Do you think I didn't know that you and Shirley discussed intimate details, like how Tommy's is huge and I can make love more than once? These are deeply personal things, and I no longer liked it when I realized that you were talking about them. But the fact that you came this far and pulled off this trick, no, it's unforgivable. Better call your sister right away and tell her that she has lost her home and her husband. And if I were you... I'd tell Tommy everything before I do it. Perhaps this way you will have at least a small chance of saving your marriage. Although, knowing Tommy, you and Shirley will be looking for an apartment soon. I saw tears rolling down her face as she gathered her things and walked towards the exit. It was already too late for regrets. I heard the door close quietly, and a minute later the engine of Shirley's car started up as Sharon drove to their house. Fifteen minutes later, my phone lit up, indicating that it was Tommy calling. I picked up the phone. Hi, Tommy. Dave, what the hell happened? Both girls locked themselves in the guest room, screaming and crying. What happened when you returned home? Knowing that I would have a lot to say to him, I sighed. Tommy, we need to talk, just the two of us, right now. But we need to talk at my house, face to face. For now, I'll just say one thing. Shirley and I are the end. It's going to be a long night and a terrible birthday. I heard Tommy's car stop in front of the house. My heart sank with anticipation. In the few minutes that had passed since the call, I tried to collect my thoughts, but the only thing that came to mind was how devastatingly everything would end. I heard a knock on the door and opened it to see Tommy with a pale face. He walked inside, taking off his coat, and barely throwing it on a chair, asked, What the hell happened? We sat down on the sofa. I took a deep breath and began to tell. He took his time and explained how Sharon had tried to seduce me, 
how she and Shirley had come up with this whole birthday plan. Tommy listened without interruption. I saw how his face became more and more tense and his eyes began to shine. When I finished, there was silence. Tommy stared at the floor, unable to find words. Finally, he looked up and whispered. They, they both deceived us. I nodded, feeling bitter. What will you do? He asked after a pause. I can't go on with Shirley. You know how I felt about her. But this betrayal, it's more than I can bear. I'll file for divorce. I told Sharon that I was going to tell you everything, and I offered her the chance to talk to you herself. Tommy leaned back, covering his face with his hands. I never would have thought that Sharon would. His voice began to tremble. But if she really did it. He fell silent, apparently collecting his thoughts. Well, I guess I can't close my eyes to this, he finally said. I have to talk to her. We sat in silence for several minutes, each immersed in our own thoughts. Then Tommy stood up, looking at me briefly. Thanks for telling me, Dave. I'm sorry this happened. I, I'll go. He left, leaving me in silence. I stood at the window, watching him drive away, and suddenly realized how empty everything around me had become. Not only the house is empty, but also my life. The evening that should have been my birthday turned into the end of what I thought was my family. But in this emptiness, oddly enough, there was something refreshing. This was the moment of truth. The moment when I finally saw reality for what it was. The next day I filed for divorce. Shirley tried to apologize and cry, but I was unmoved. As I expected, Tommy left Sharon within a few weeks and they too began the process of divorce. He and I began to see each other less often because our common past was destroyed. But time passed, and despite the pain, I began to build a new life. A year later, I moved to another city, started a new job, and met new people. Shirley and Sharon are a thing of the past, as is the chapter of my life I left behind. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.